In the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier. Amen. Please be seated. The frugal Lutheran walked into the house panting and almost completely exhausted. I haven't come in quite his wife. It's a great new idea I had to be a better steward of our resources, he gasped. I ran all the way home from the stewardship committee meeting behind the bus and saved a dollar fifty. It wasn't very bright, replied his boss to boy. Why didn't you run behind a taxi and save ten dollars? <laughs> <laughs> About two weeks ago, Yvonne Chenard, the founder and owner of Patagonia Outdoor Clothing Company, donated the ownership of his business to a trust so that the profits from that trust can be used to fight the climate crisis. He was inspired, he said, to do this when in 2017, Forbes magazine put an article that described him, wrote an article about him that described him as a billionaire. He considered that he was a failure. To amass the kind of wealth that would lead you to be described as a billionaire was for him a sign that he failed. He founded his company, to simply provide rugged outdoor wear for mountain climbers, a passion of his. He grew into a worldwide brand and he grew rich off. Where other billionaires were taking Bill Gates' challenge to leave the vast amount of their estate to charities, Yvonne was unwilling to wait until he was dead to see the money put to good use. It's taken him five years to set up a trust that will own the company of Patagonian clothing and the profits from that trust will go to help the fight the climate crisis. I'm sure you can't help but hear the parallels with our gospel passage and the call of Jesus on the life of St. Matthew, come and follow me. And Matthew got up and followed Jesus, leaving everything behind. Ah, uh, I know though, big stories. They're hyperbole. They're massive examples of a principle. Not anything any of us would do, right? Just to take those moments of men's lives is not representative of anything, correct? Except maybe it just might be for some. Chenard's company, Patagonia, has always been an interesting company. In 1984, it had a cafeteria that while others were serving deep fried food, was his cafeteria was serving healthy, mostly vegetarian meals. His company provided on-site childcare facility for the workers in 1980s. In 1986, the company committed to tithing, that is 10% of its profits, or 1% of its sales, whichever one was greater, that money would be given to environmental activism, even down to working on local environmental programs so the people doing it could have a full-time job while they did. In the 1990s, an audit revealed the carbon footprint of the cotton, the cotton that they used to produce their clothing. The carbon footprint was very heavy, so Chanel committed the company to organic cotton as early as 1996. This donation of this whole company, far from being a one-off, is actually a continuation and perhaps a climax of a life spent trying to get rid of his success and do something good for the planet. Matthew's response to leave the tax booth was hardly a one-off. He spent the next three years following Jesus and learning from him. Then, following the events of Jesus' death and resurrection, Matthew continued as an apostle, firstly to the Judean people, and Christian tradition holds that he spread the good news to other countries particularly in the method for evangelising the people of Ethiopia. And eventually Matthew would give up his life, being martyred for the faith that he grew into. All because when Jesus called, he answered. That one moment of leaving everything led to a life that was changed. This week's theme in the season of creation is the curse of affluence. We've been asked to look at our lives and see clearly that we live in affluent times and are people of great wealth. There was an article in the Financial Review this past week, actually, 
that reveal that Australians are the world's richest people. If you take the mean wealth, meaning, take the wealth value in dollars, where half the country is richer than you and half the country is poorer than you, that one middle person, if you take that number of wealth that they have and compare it to every other country in the world in the same manner, Australia is the top of the table. On the back of soaring house prices for sure, but still, that's where we sit. On the other hand, if you take the average wealth, that is, take all the wealth, the household wealth of Australia, divided by the number of people, we rank number four in the world. Either way you cut it, we are wealthy people. Our country is very wealthy. Yes, a lot of it is on paper and tied up in housing, but still, that's so much more than so many others, in fact most of the rest of the world. So what exactly is the curse of affluence? It is in recognising that while we are wealthy, many in this world are not, and that outcomes for those who are not wealthy can be dire. We know, surely we know, that health outcomes are low for those who live in poverty. Surely we know that the opportunity afforded to people is lower if you live in poverty. For that matter, we know that those who live in wealth tend to consume more resources of the planet than those who live in poverty. Take the outcry of people coming to climate summits around the world via private jet versus those who travel in economy on airlines or perhaps if you're a teenage girl, take a boat across the Atlantic Ocean. I used to think, how is it that we can lift all these people out of poverty with the amount of resources that we, the wealthy, consume? If we were to lift everyone out of poverty and they all consume the kind of resources we in the West do, the carbon footprint of the world's poorest live like the wealthiest. Australia ranks number two in the world. If the whole world lived like Australians, we would need six thirds to sustain the world. It's a scary thought. We can't support that many people living on the planet like we do. But then I was challenged. That's the wrong question. How can the world support everyone living like me? It simply can't. Instead, instead, perhaps we should be asking, how do I change the way I'm living so that everyone may live? It's a much more sharp and pointed question. It is perhaps though the honest question about how we create a global just society that is good for the planet as well as good for people. I love the passage that Gina read from Jeremiah. And I've got to say, well done. Uh, those names, good job. <laughs> I noticed no one else was jumping up to help you out. I love that passage, not because of all those names, but because it's a brilliant passage about hope. And perhaps when we're talking about global affluence and climate change and season of creation and all of that, we need to be reminded of hope. The story is that Jeremiah is in prison with the king Zedekiah in Jerusalem. The Babylonians, the enemy, they're at the gate. Jerusalem is besieged. Israel has fallen, and it is just Jerusalem left. And in that moment, Jeremiah has a vision of buying a field from his cousin. Terrible time to buy and sell land, isn't it? When the enemy is about to carry the wall off into exile. Also time to have affordable money though, isn't it? And if the enemy is coming and going to carry you off to Babylon in exile, you can smuggle the money. You can't smuggle the land, can you? But Jeremiah, at God's request, goes ahead and buys the field. Why? Because it's a sign of hope that fields will again be bought and sold in Israel. It doesn't matter how dark it gets, God will bring hope and light into the situation. 
When we think about what we might need to give up or change, for many people, they see it as nothing but loss. What would I lose to ensure the world can sustain the people of the world? But God is speaking into Jeremiah's life an act of hope. And I believe God still speaks into our lives acts of hope too. Think about earlier this year, in the midst of the floods, despair and hopelessness. For some, it absolutely was. But if we pull back for a moment and look at what happened in that time, the mass of volunteers in that moment that pitched in to lend a hand, people that still continue to do that. Those people changed and continue to change something about their life to accommodate those in need. That was an act of hope in the midst of despair. That was a moment of buying a field when the raiders were at the gate. What change might it take to enable the world to live with equity and justice? I don't know the answer to that, but I know that I'm inspired by Yvonne Chenard. I know that I'm inspired by St. Matthew. And I know that I'm inspired by the promise of hope from Jeremiah. I don't know what's ahead for the rest of the world, or for us. I know that I've responded in ways that I already can do. I've got to admit, I recycle now more than I ever did. And as often as I can, I walk to the shops rather than take a car. And I separate the rubbish out so much that when we had friends visiting from elsewhere in the country, they commented on how much Brent and I do to separate recyclables, rubbish and green waste. They said they were a little embarrassed by how much we did it. And as we look at replacing our car, we're certainly looking top of the list at a monetary car. What else would be asked of us? I don't know. But I know that those of us with, with wealth will need to change. But to be honest, it fills me with hope. I take inspiration from Yvonne Chenard, St. Matthew, and Jeremiah. We know that God is calling us into a future built with hope, but a hope for all the world, not just the Apple. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.